Hi, my name is Dawn Matthews. Welcome to another lesson in this series of lessons on e-communication. And today we will explore computer networks. Now, a network is any system of things that are connected to each other. This connection allows each part of the network to interact with the other parts and share information or resources. There are many different kinds of networks that link us together. I'm sure that you've also been involved in some kind of network before. For example, imagine that your friend shows up at your house with a hot new CD. You ask him where he got it, and he tells you that the music store at the mall is having a clearing out sale. After you hear this news, you call a friend to tell her the good news, and then you rush down to the music store and buy your own copy. That's networking at its best. Everyone has personal networks of friends, family and acquaintances. But these are invisible networks held together by connections that can't be touched. A more physical example of a network is the transport system that connects the various towns and cities of our country. Roads and railways can be seen and they help us transport goods and people from one place to another. There are other kinds of networks that do not move physical goods. These are called communication networks. A communication network allows data communication to occur and it is this kind of network that we will be focusing on today. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to discuss the advantages of computer networking, list five elements necessary to link computers in a network, List the four types of computer networks. A telephone system is one example of a communication network. Just think of all the telephone cables which run from house to house and town to town. Voices are carried along these cables and enable us to make local, national and international phone calls. This network allows people from any part of the world to be connected. Like many other big networks, the phone network is a public service network that we can all use. Now, do you still remember the three components of communication? Sure, Dawn. The sender, the receiver and the communication channel. Good. Now, I want you to phone a friend so that we can discuss how the phone network allows us all to connect with each other. Well, when I dial his number and he answers, Lloyd and I are connected. The telephone carries our messages between us. And that is the communication channel. Hello? Hey, Salavia, how are you? Hey, yes, and the telephone line you used is a dial-up line. When you dial Lloyd's number, you and Lloyd are connected and are allowed use of the line for the duration of the call. And when I hang up? When you hang up, the connection is ended. And the same line will be available for other users of the telephone network. Now, can you imagine if there was no network? Each person would have to be individually connected. So a network makes it possible for many people to use common resources. This obviously saves everybody money. So this is why it makes sense to connect computers in a network. Yes, Eli. Financial benefits are one important reason for networking computers. They come about because network computers can share printers, scanners and servers. But equally important is the fact that computer networks allow people to share other resources like information. Mm, and this can save a lot of time and effort. Yes. If computers in an organization are linked together in a network, many people can share the same documents, software, and can also communicate with each other electronically. In a network, the know-how and experience of many people is being shared and is available to everyone. Wow, this is really an amazing use of technology. <laughs> a computer network exists when at least two computers are connected in some way, such as by a network cable. The cables usually used to connect computers are called UTP cables. This stands for unshielded twisted pair. A UTP cable is very similar to a telephone cable. This cable is the communication channel, allowing data to be sent and received from computer to computer.
Usually, however, more than two computers are connected and in this case, a server and hub are needed. Other hardware devices like printers and scanners can also be connected. This type of network is often used in offices and increasingly in schools. A computer network has recently been installed in Litsiboho High's computer center. Why don't we meet up with Archie and see what he has found out. Right, Archie, this is our computer lab. Here we've got over 20 computers connected via a network. Wow, this is like really awesome, eh? So what is a hub? Good question, Archie. A hub is a device that connects and organizes the network cables that link all the computers together. A hub is like the center of the network and can be used to send or direct information electronically from one computer on the network to another. And over here is a server. Oh yes, I remember the server. We discussed it when we learned about types of computers and hardware. Correct. A server is a kind of computer. A very powerful one with a fast processor, lots of memory and plenty of storage space. The software and information that all the computers and other devices on the network share is all stored on the server. All the network computers connect to the server via the hub. So is that all that is needed to set up a network? No, not quite. All these computers need a special piece of hardware called a network interface card to connect to the server. Without a network interface card, you would not be able to plug the network cable into the back of the computer. And if your computer doesn't have access to the network, it won't be able to connect to the server. Wow, this new technology is like really cool. And thanks for the information. Sure, you're welcome, Archie. Thanks. So now you have seen how a network can be used in a school environment. But do you know how a network interface card connects to the motherboard and supplies a port for the network cable? Hmm, Dawn, not really. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. Why don't you try and connect to a network and I'll talk you through it. Here is a network interface card. Good. Do you see the port that it has? This is where the network cable plugs in. Why don't you plug it in? Done it. Also remember that the other end of the network cable has to be plugged into the hub. So the hub has to have enough ports for all the network cables. Okay, once all the cables are connected to the hub, it can select and operate specific computing devices on the network, depending on the instructions it is processing. This helps improve network performance. Once the computers are physically linked together by network cables, you now have to set up the network software so that all the computers can see each other. You do this by sharing. What? Sharing? <laughs> An operating system such as Windows allows users to share hard drives and other devices like printers so that they can be accessed and used by any user on the network. This can be done by changing settings in the control panel. But if I'm sharing, won't everybody have access to what I'm doing? They could have, Salai. This method of peer-to-peer -peer sharing does not offer very much security as anyone can see and access the information on your computer. Is this the case with all networks? Well, in bigger networks like a school's computer center or a business where there are many computers connected together, there needs to be stricter control of file sharing and access to disks. That's why many large networks have a network administrator. The network administrator is the person who is in charge of a company's network. They use special network software like Windows NT or Novell to control their networks. But how do they make sure that nobody gets access to my information? To make sure that a network is secure, the network administrator creates a unique identity for each computer user on the network. This identity can be in the form of a name or a number. And before a user can get onto the network, they must enter their ID and password into the system. The user ID also tells the network software which files the user can access 
and which files they cannot, depending on their levels of access. All this ID information is stored on the central server of the network. So for example, when a teacher logs onto the network using his user ID and password, he can gain access to the exam marks. But when a pupil logs onto the network using their user ID and password, the student will not be able to open the exam marks document. It doesn't matter if the student uses the same computer as the teacher as it is the user ID and not the computer ID that determines your level of access on the network. You have learned a lot about networks at Letziborgo High. What you have learned applies to all networks which range from the small two-computer network to the larger 25-computer network and to even bigger ones. Computer networks come in many different sizes and we can classify networks according to area they cover. Here are the four types of computer networks. If computers are separated by short distances and the computers belong to a single company, school or organization, we call it a local area network or LAN. The network in Letiborgo High's computer center was an example of a LAN. The owners of the computers are responsible for installation and maintenance of their network and they can share printers and data between their computers. Often a computer network covers an entire city or metropolitan area like the municipality of Johannesburg. In this kind of network, all the computers still belong to the same company, but they're located in many different buildings. These buildings are all connected together by phone lines, but inside the buildings, the computers are connected to the network by standard network cables. If the buildings are in line of sight of each other, they can also be connected using microwave transmitters and receivers. This is called a Metropolitan Area Network or MAN. So we have discussed two types of networks, LAN and a MAN. That's right. But if the computer network spreads over a very wide area, like a province or a country, it is called a Wide Area Network or WAN. If this network belongs to one company, like a bank, it can be called an Enterprise WAN. This kind of network is useful for banks because they have branches and ATMs all over the country. And it is very convenient to have all these branches and ATMs linked together. WANs are connected by telephone lines, satellites or microwaves. So it's a LAN, a MAN and a WAN. <laughs> Correct, Salai. But today, most small networks are also part of a bigger network called the Internet. The Internet is generally regarded as the world's largest computer network. The Internet is a network that connects individual PCs and company networks in such a way that they all combine to form one enormous network that covers the entire planet. Since the Internet spans countries and continents, it is called a Global Area Network or GAN. Now that we have found out so much about computer networks, I think you're ready for your task. List the five elements necessary to link computers in a network and the device which stores information on the network. If the computers in your school are networked, see if you can find each of these elements. Name the four types of computer networks and state the area covered by each. List at least four advantages of linking computers in a network. Thank you for joining us in this exciting lesson on networks. And don't forget to visit our website for more information. See you next time when we will investigate the internet. Goodbye.